verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. We're given a time marker for these two chapters, chapter 32 and 33. The time marker is that it's in the 10th year of Zedekiah's reign. Well, let me tell you something. In the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign, everything was gone and destroyed, completely gone. In the 10th year, the Babylonian siege began. And in those days, oftentimes when they would attack a city, they would do it with a siege. A mighty army would come and surround a walled city and establish attacking positions throughout the city. The city would defend themselves the very best that they could, and then it was a waiting game. How long could the city withstand the siege inside their own walls? At the time Jeremiah wrote this, Jerusalem was surrounded by a Babylonian army absolutely intent on destroying the city and completing their destruction of the region of Judah. Jerusalem was the last nut to be cracked to totally conquering the kingdom of Judah. And where was Jeremiah? You saw it right there in verse 2. Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison. You know, it's bad enough having a city under siege. When you're in prison, in a city that's like in a prison, you're like in a double prison. Well, why was Jeremiah in prison? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at verse 3. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldean, but surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Why was Jeremiah in prison? Because he prophesied against Zedekiah, the king of Judah. Can we just pause for a moment and admire the courage of Jeremiah the prophet? Jeremiah knew that people were against him. He wasn't afraid to speak. uh, I'll use a phrase that's overused. It's a cliche in our day and age. He spoke truth to power in the most real and personal way. And when he spoke truth to power, it ended up that he suffered for it. He ended up in prison. Why? Because his word was, look at verse 5, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon. This was the word that Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, gave the prophet Jeremiah to proclaim not just to the people, but to the king himself. Now, King Zedekiah didn't like it that Jeremiah told the people that the Babylonians were going to win. Matter of fact, King Zedekiah thought this was treason. Here's Zedekiah trying to rally the people of Judah and Jerusalem to defend the city against the siege all around him. And friends, in a battle like that, morale matters a lot. And what's Jeremiah going around? Jeremiah is going around prophesying, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. They're going to win. You may as well surrender. We're going to lose. King Zedekiah did not like that message. He threw him in prison. Notice verse 5, though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. That was the word. He added on there in verse 4, Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans. Jeremiah not only prophesied the fall of Jerusalem and Judah in general, but the captivity of King Zedekiah personally. Zedekiah, you're going down. And you're going to have to face the king of Babylon eye to eye, face to face. You might pause just for a moment here. The reason why this was a frightening prospect to Zedekiah, king of Judah, was that he was placed on the throne of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. He was a puppet king of Nebuchadnezzar. But he rebelled against his puppet master. He heard and heard the rumors that Nebuchadnezzar had so much trouble in other parts of his kingdom that it was a good time to rebel, and that's what he did. Guess what? It wasn't a good time to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar now has come against him, and Jeremiah prophesied, you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar face to face, eye to eye. Why do I pause right here? Ladies and gentlemen, when you have been a rebel against your master, 
It is a scary thing to face him face to face, eye to eye. And is that not the destiny of every human being on the day of judgment? What was Zedekiah going to say before Nebuchadnezzar? Whoops! Oh, I, I meant well. There's no way to cover it over when you have rebelled against your master, your king. You can't cover that one up. If it was true between Zedekiah and Nebuchadnezzar, how much more between the creature and the creator? between us and the God that we will have to answer to. Continuing on now, verse 6. And Jeremiah said, oh, just, just a minute, it, this is Santa Barbara. We, everybody knows about real estate, right? Everybody's into real estate around here. This is going to be the weirdest real estate transaction you ever heard of in your life. You ready? Verse 6. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is in Anaoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anaoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that it was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle who was in Anathoth, and I weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open, and I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Mashiach, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison." Do you get what's happening here, folks? Let me explain it to you. Verse 7, God told Jeremiah while he was in prison, your cousin, Hanamel, is going to come to you, and Hanamel is going to say, Jeremiah, please buy my field, which is in Ananoth. Please. Ananoth was Jeremiah's hometown. That's where he came from. It was only three miles from Jerusalem. So one day, Hanamel walks over to the prison. He visits Jeremiah. He goes, Je Jeremiah, please do this. And when it happened, just as God told him it would happen, Jeremiah said, this is the word of the Lord. I need to do this, and I need to go through with the purchase. And he might be hearing, so what? I don't care about a prophet's real estate buying habits. Friends, do you realize? Ananoth was under Babylonian captivity right then. If the Babylonian armies encircled the walls of Jerusalem... Ananoth, three miles away, was already conquered by the Babylonians. It, it would be like this. Let's just pretend. Can we play let's pretend just for a moment? Let's pretend that the Canadians conquer the United States. I know that's a pretend, but we're just pretending here. Canadians conquer the United States, and they're making their way down from the north. And they've already conquered Goleta. They're making their way down to Carpinteria. And you're in a prison, you're in a jail cell in Carpinteria, and somebody who lives in Goleta says, hey, do you want to buy my house? I'll sell it to you. You, go, you know, there's just one thing I don't understand. My title deed to the property is worthless now that the Babylonians have conquered it. Who cares? It's the stupidest real estate deal ever. I, I mean, plus I'm in prison and I can't exactly take advantage of the land. This was the craziest real estate deal ever conceived, but because God told Jeremiah to do it, what did he do? He did it. He did it. He, verse 8, Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord, and he bought it. He paid out 17 shekels of silver because God told him to do it. Even though the Babylonians controlled Ananoth and would soon control everything when they conquered Jerusalem in the same way that Jeremiah had prophesied, he bought the property everywhere. Now let me tell you something. The keepers of the prison... And everybody else must have thought that Jeremiah was crazy. And Hananel, the cousin, must have thought that he was the luckiest guy around and Jeremiah was the stupidest real estate buyer on the face of the earth. 
We don't even know whether or not 17 shekels was a lot of money for that piece of land because we don't know anything about the land. Remember, location, location, location. But, but listen, to pay a nickel for that land would have been too much because it was worth nothing with the Babylonians conquering it. Yet Jeremiah made the transaction because God told him to make it. And don't you find it interesting in verse 10 how it goes on and says, in the presence of witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison, they did it all, they, they went through a normal title search and escrow and all the rest of it. They went through all the formalities that they went through in that day, including putting the documents in an earthenware jar. Well, we're going to read that in just a minute. They, they did everything that they should do. Verse 13, then I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both the purchase deed, which is sealed, and the deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields shall be possessed again in this land. Friends, that is what makes sense of all this. Jeremiah, under instructions from the Lord, makes a crazy real estate purchase, a foolish one by any measure of good business. He takes the documents and he says, not only are we going to do this, we're going to put them in a time capsule and bury it in the ground. By the way, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered 2,000 years later in just those kind of earthenware jars hidden out in the desert. So this was a fairly safe way to keep documents, at least for some period of time. God said, I want you to keep, put them in a time capsule. Put them in a safe deposit box because this is my promise to you. Did you see it right there in verse 15? Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. This was God's promise and the purpose for an otherwise foolish property purchase. Now understand this. Jeremiah, with all his might, with all his strength, prophesied that the Babylonians were going to succeed in conquering Jerusalem and Judah. There was no way, Jeremiah's word to them was surrender. You may as well give up now. But Jeremiah was just as strong and was just as passionate in prophesying, there will be a restoration. God will bring his people back. God will bring them back into the land. And basically, do you see the wonderful display of faith that Jeremiah said? He said, I believe so strongly that God will bring them back into the land that I'm going to make an otherwise foolish purchase because 70 years from now, even though Jeremiah himself never came back from the captivity, he said, 70 years from now, my descendants are going to be able to do something with this land. We are coming back to the land, and I'm so sure of it that I'm going to buy a piece of it here and now. That property purchase from prison was an expression in God's confident, an expression of confident trust in God's promise that the land would be possessed again. Now, that's not to say that it was easy for Jeremiah. And why? Let me just explain something to you. Do you know what happens in a city under siege time? Food becomes an incredibly valued commodity. Something about supply and demand. There's a very big demand and there's a very small supply. Uh, supply. And because of the small supply and the big demand, food costs a lot. You want to hang on to every shekel you have so that you could buy a little cracker that will sustain you for a few hours because you're going to need every scrap of money that you have. This was a big thing for Jeremiah to give up 17 shekels in a symbolic purchase. He really had to trust God through that. Well, he has questions about it. Look at it here in verse 16. Now, when I had delivered the purchase deed to Barak, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquities of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, you are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You've set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day. And in Israel and among other men, you have made yourself a name as it is this day. 
You have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, and with great terror, you've given them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came and took possession of it, but they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. They have done nothing of all that you have commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. By the way, isn't this a beautiful prayer that Jeremiah pours out from his heart? He's confused, he doesn't quite know what's going on, and he cries out to the Lord, I prayed to the Lord, verse 17, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and then he says, there is nothing too hard for you. Isn't that beautiful? God, there's nothing too hard for you. Isn't that sometimes what we just gotta believe when we pray? There is nothing too hard for you, God. You are that big, you're that powerful, you're that majestic. Nothing is too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands. Verse 19, your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of man. Verse 21, you brought your people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But he knew, verse 23, they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. You see, in contrast to the great love and goodness of God, Jeremiah could look all around the walls of Jerusalem and see the Babylonian army itching to break through and to destroy everything in the city. Friends, I wonder what it would be like to live in a city under siege. Oh, it happens in modern times from time to time, but what a terror, what a stress it would be to live every moment knowing that there is an angry army intent on breaking through the walls and killing you and taking everything that you have. And here's the thing, Jeremiah looked at that army all around and he goes, we've deserved it. We've done this. We have invited it upon ourselves. Now he says, making the request in his prayer, verse 24, look, the siege mounds, they've come up to the city to take it, and the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword and famine and pestilence. What have you spoken has happened? There you see it, and yet you have said to me, O Lord God, buy the field for money and take witnesses? Yet the city's been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Lord, I see the armies out there. I know what they're gonna do. I know this is how it's gonna go down. Why, God, why did you want me to buy that piece of land? It's hard enough to get food in prison, much less in a siege. What am I gonna do? I'm never gonna get those 17 shekels back. Verse 26, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against the city shall come and set fire to this city and burn it with the houses on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and bored out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with the work of their hands, says the Lord. For this city has been a provocation of anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they've turned to me the back and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not listened to receive instruction but they set their abominations and the house which is called by my name to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech which I did not command them nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. God lays out the bad news. Jeremiah, you admitted that the people of Judah were guilty. But Jeremiah, do you understand just how guilty they are? Do you get it, Jeremiah? Yes, Jeremiah, you're right. Verse 27, 
I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Listen, Jeremiah, if I wanted to deliver Judah, I could deliver them. I don't care about the Babylonian army surrounding Judah. You know, about 150 years before this, I'm using the dates very approximately, but about 150 years before this, an Assyrian army surrounded Jerusalem in very much the same way that the Babylonian army surrounded them right now. And you know what God did to that Assyrian army? In one night, he sent an angel, and that angel slaughtered 100,000 Assyrian troops. Is there anything too hard for me, the Lord says? Oh, if I wanted to deliver Jerusalem from this Babylonian army, I could certainly do it, but no, verse 28, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans. Why? Look at some of their sins. Verse 29, on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods. God looked down from heaven and there was a citizen of Jerusalem offering idolatry to Baal and drink offerings to other gods. They did it on the roofs of their own houses and God says, I'm gonna destroy that house. I'm gonna bring judgment upon this city. If there's anything worse, verse 35, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the horrific Canaanite gods that Israel in their idolatry worshiped was a God known as Molech. And in the worship of Molech, children, babies, were sacrificed and burned to death. Now, uh, let me say this. To me, it's very important for me to give you the straight story and to not exaggerate. There is not archaeological evidence in the Valley of Hinnom of child sacrifice. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Perhaps it happened, but it happened on a relatively small scale. Listen, a lot of times, friends, for things to be found with archaeological evidence, either it had to be done massively or it's just luck, so to speak, from the archaeologist's spade. Maybe they worship Molech with child sacrifice very rarely. Maybe they did. But let me say this. It was still a stench in the nostrils of God. Maybe, maybe, only 3% of the worship that went to Molech was in the form of child sacrifice. But if it was, it was a stench before the nostrils of God. I can't help but read this and think in my own mind, not even these child sacrificers sold the parts of those babies to other people. Mm. Not even these lined their pockets with the profits made from children sacrificed. Billy Graham said it many years ago. It's hard to see how it's not true today. He said, if God does not judge the United States of America, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And friends, I don't know if you're aware, but because certainly the media does not want you to, to be aware of this. I don't know if you're aware that the United States has the most radical, death-loving abortion laws in the entire Western world. To find abortion laws that are comparable to the United States, I mean things that allow partial birth abortion, abortion all the way up to the time, on and on, to find laws comparable to that, you gotta go to China and North Korea. Europe, no European country has laws like that. And, and this is something our nation's gonna have to answer for. God made Judah answer for it. What, do we get an exemption? 
Now, that's the bad news. That's the bad news. Should we look at some good news? Verse 36. God just explained why the armies surrounded them and were going to conquer. Now, verse 36. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it shall be delivered in the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. And I will bring them back to this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way, and they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good. Yes, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice. Rejoice over them to do good and will assuredly plant them in the land with all my heart and with all my soul. That's the good news. Yes, Jeremiah, Jerusalem's going down. The Babylonians will conquer it. You can be assured of it. But Jeremiah, just as sure as that's going to happen, I will bring them back and I will restore them. And God speaks in such a powerful and beautiful way, not only of the near restoration, later to come under Ezra and Nehemiah, the return from exile that's described in the scriptures, but even more pointedly, of the ultimate restoration of Israel under the new covenant. Because what he says here goes beyond what happened just under the, knee, um, the restoration under Ezra and Jeremiah. I mean, look at the new covenant terminology. Verse 38, they shall be my people and I will be their God. Verse 38, I will give them one heart and one way. The last time we were in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 31, we saw this is new covenant terminology. This is God describing what he will do with his people under the new covenant. And then look at what he says in verse 41. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. You see, a further aspect of the new covenant is that the disposition of God, his attitude towards them would be changed. Instead of an attitude of judgment, he would rejoice over them to do good. Friends, that is the property of the believer under the new covenant. Because this beautiful new covenant that God offered to Israel, this remarkable thing that he gave them, this is what he says. Now, he doesn't describe it in the Old Testament this way. He really doesn't. This was a mystery to be revealed under the New Testament dispensation. But the great truth is under the new covenant, though he made it with Israel here, we know from the Greek scriptures, from the New Testament, God says, hey, Gentiles, you can get on in on us too. Come in. And under the new covenant, every believer has that beautiful promise of God's disposition. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And notice this, God is so zealous to accomplish this, would you please look at the end of verse 41, that he promised to do it with all of my heart and with all of my soul. Can we just agree? God doesn't often speak like that. You Bible experts out there, how often in the scriptures does God say something like this? I'm gonna do it with all my heart and with all my soul. That's language he expects from us. But there's a few beautiful places where God says, I am so zealous to bless my people under the new covenant that I endeavor with all my heart, with all my soul to do it. Do you know how much God wants to bless you for Jesus' sake? He wants to do it with all his heart, with all his soul. Friends, this shows that God is so generous in his blessing to us. Our problem is we just need to receive the bounty that he gives to us by faith. We're not there begging a reluctant God. Oh God, please bless me. I promise I'll be better. No, we come boldly because of our high priest and our savior, Jesus Christ. And because he's instituted a new covenant, we come with that kind of boldness. And we say, Lord, you say that you want to bless me with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 42, for thus says the Lord, just as I have brought out this great calamity on this people, so I will bring on them all the good that I have promised them. And fields will be bought in this land of which you say it's desolate without man or beast. It's been given to the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, 
Sign deeds and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, and in the cities of the south, for I will cause their captives to return, says the Lord. Jeremiah, do you know why I told you to make that fool purchase a property? Because you as a people, you're coming back. And what I told you to do was a prophetic picture That one day business will return to normal. One day people will buy and sell land just as it should be. One day it'll happen all again because I am a God of beautiful and powerful restoration. Now chapter 33. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison saying, by the way, now you know why we're taking these two chapters at once. We're keeping with him in prison. These are the prison chronicles of Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Well, there he is in prison, still shut up in the prison for preaching that the Babylonians were gonna win and the people of Jerusalem, especially King Zedekiah, were going to lose. And what did God say to him? He says, listen, Jeremiah, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's a wonderful promise in prayer, don't you think? God inviting me. Call to me and I'll answer. Come on, pray. Come on, people. Here I am. I'm ready to hear your prayers. What a beautiful thing for God. Would we blame God for being hard to get when it came to prayer? But he doesn't. He invites us. Call to me and I'll answer you, he says. Now, you know what's really amazing about that? Remember, the Babylonian armies surrounded Jerusalem when God told Jeremiah that. And don't you think that there were a lot of people sending out anguished cries to God? Oh, God, help! God, rescue us from the Babylonians! And because God did not say yes to those prayers... There were probably a lot of people in Jerusalem that time who said, what's the use of praying? God's saying, no, listen, I have this necessary work of judgment to do, but it doesn't mean that I want you to stop praying. May I speak a word to someone here, and I don't know who you are, but I'll speak to you as if I was speaking to you face to face. I want to speak to someone here who has been sorely disappointed because God did not answer your prayer. And it sticks in you like an ache. It's like a sore, like an itch you can't get rid of. God, I really wanted you to answer that prayer. Just like the citizens of Jerusalem no doubt prayed that God would take away the Babylonians. God didn't take away the Babylonians. And as far as you can tell, He didn't answer your prayer. Can I just ask you, don't stop praying. I I don't have an answer for you as to why your prayers seem to go unanswered. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you. But what I'm just saying is that things may be in the plan and purpose of God that we don't understand. It doesn't mean that we should stop praying. His word to you and to me is the same word that he spoke to Jeremiah Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Verse four, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, which have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mounds and the sword. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men whom I will slay in my anger and my fury for all those wickedness that I have hidden my face from this city. Behold, I will bring it health and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return and will rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I shall do, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. God said, listen, 
I know the houses are being destroyed. I know the cities are being laid away. So, excuse me, the, the, the city of Jerusalem being laid waste. And, and I know how futile it is to fight against the Babylonians. Look at what it says here in verse 5. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with dead bodies. That's how much sense it made to fight against the Babylonians. But God says that is not going to be the last word. Look at verse 6. Behold, I will bring it health and healing. At the time God spoke this to and through Jeremiah, Jerusalem was filled with death and destruction. It was everywhere. But God says, no, I haven't given up. I'm going to bring health and healing. I am going to reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. I'm going to cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return. I'm going to cleanse them from all their iniquity. They're going to be a name of joy, a praise, and an honor. And it's going to be so wonderful. Look at verse 9 with me. It's going to be so wonderful that they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I shall provide for it. I want some of that. When the Babylonians surround your city and there's dead bodies everywhere and the future looks even worse, we fear and tremble, don't we? We shake. We're disturbed. We're we're messed up to our very core. God says, Jerusalem, that's how you are now. I'm going to bring blessings so abundant. Let me read it again. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I shall provide for it. Oh, Lord, it's so good, I can't believe it. It's so good that I'm shaking. Man, I want some of that. But God says, that's going to be the glory of my restoration that I bring. Now, on a small level, this was fulfilled in the return from exile under Ezra and Nehemiah. But that's only on a small, partial level. Ultimately, this is new covenant, kingdom of God, messianic kingdom talk. That's where it will be ultimately fulfilled. Verse 10, thus says the Lord, again, there shall be heard in this place of which you say it's desolate without man or without beast. In the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant, without beast, without the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, this is what they're going to say, praise the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good for his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Can you imagine with me what Jerusalem was like under siege? Can you imagine the screaming? Can can you imagine the anguished cries? Can you imagine the sound of children crying nonstop just from hunger, if from nothing else? Can you imagine how maddening the sound would be of animals dying in your midst? of the war chants of the Babylonians just over the wall. Can you imagine all the fearful sounds of a city under siege? And then God says, then there's even a worse sound. It's the sound of silence when the city's conquered. You don't hear anything. Jerusalem becomes, at least for a season, a ghost town. And you walk through those streets and you think, you know, children used to laugh and play here. There used to be sound. This used to be a marketplace. They used to haggle over the price of hummus over there. You think it's all quiet. It's all desolate now. God says, listen to the sounds that I'm going to bring back to Jerusalem. Verse 11, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. I'm going to bring the happiest sounds you can imagine back to Jerusalem. Isn't that beautiful? It's just beautiful to think of that. God says, first you had the sounds of terror during the siege. Then you had the sounds of silence. 
I'm going to bring back the sound of joy. And this is what people are going to say as they walk up to the temple. Verse 11, praise the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good for his mercy endures forever. Instead of the anguished cries of a city under judgment, they would hear people praising the Lord together. Friends, that's restoration. And God says, I'm going to bring it to Jerusalem. Verse 12, thus says the Lord of hosts, and the place which is desolate without man and without beast in all its cities, there shall again be a dwelling place of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, the flock shall again pass under the hands of him who counts them, says the Lord. It's gonna be so beautiful that he uses this picture, it's really just a picture, of a shepherd with his flock there in the city. And we look at that and we go, oh. That's how it is, right? When you're driving through the countryside and you see a whole flock of sheep, what do you do? You go, oh. There's just something peaceful about seeing a shepherd with all his sheep. And God says, this is the contrast between the terror of the siege and the beauty of my restoration. Can I add one more thing here? Well, of course, again, who's going to rush the stage and stop me? (laughs) Verse 13, where it says, please, nobody, please. (laughs) He says at the end of verse 13, the flocks shall again pass under the hands of him who counts them. In Targums, which are some Jewish interpretations of the text, inexplicably, him who counts them They say it's the Messiah. They will pass under the hand of the Messiah who counts them. Isn't that beautiful? And the idea is of a shepherd standing at the doorway and as his sheep come in, he counts them one by one. And you know what he does is he counts them. He touches them one by one as they walk by. Lord, I am your sheep. Please count me as I come into your pen. That's just a beautiful little picture. Verse 14, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord, our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually. This is fascinating because first of all, in verse 14, he says, listen, I will perform that good thing that I promised. And friends, again, as we look at these passages, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. We see a partial fulfillment in these under Nehemiah and Ezra. But the complete fulfillment has to be in the messianic age. It just has to be. Because notice here, verse 15, in those days and at that time I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. Friends, way back in Jeremiah chapter 23, that branch was set forth. That's the Messiah. That's the Messiah. The branch of righteousness. And whatever you want to say about how beautiful it was when Israel was restored from exile under Ezra and Nehemiah, the Messiah did not reign in Jerusalem at that time. He said, no, I'm going to bring up to David a branch of righteousness, and he will reign, verse 15, he shall execute judgment and righteousness in Israel. Is that what it says in verse 15? No, he shall execute righteousness and judgment in the earth. Again, we're talking about the messianic age when the Messiah rules over the earth, no doubt the millennial earth, and in that day, Jerusalem will be called by this name, verse 16, this is the name by which she will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now what blows our mind? This is a title, Yahweh Tzidkenu, which is previously given to the Messiah. Jerusalem, and it may be speaking of the new Jerusalem here, will so reflect the nature and the character of the Messiah that the city itself will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now you can't call Jerusalem that now, Anybody who's had a camera stolen in the Arab market can tell you right now, you can't call it now the Lord our righteousness. But this is God's holy promise to bring this ultimate restoration. 
Verse 19. excuse me here, verse 19. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may be also broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered nor the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply to the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister to me. Friends, this is heavy. God says, look, here's my money back guarantee. Do you want to know how you can know I'm going to do these things? If I fail to restore Israel, you can have the sun and the moon. That's my pledge to you. That's my down payment. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, then, then this will be broken. And then he says, there will always be a son to reign on his throne. Verse 21, we understand that to be fulfilled in the Messiah very plainly. But then he says, and with the Levites, the priests, and my ministers, verse 22, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Friends, if this speaks of the messianic age and the reign of the Messiah, I have to say, this is a bit of a mystery to me. I don't know if I can fully explain it. There is apparently, in a way, and I'm just being very upfront with you, I don't really understand this fully. I don't know if I ever will. There will be some kind of Levitical work and service to be performed. Isn't this what he says? Just as much as the Messiah's reign is this way, so with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. It is possible that this is fulfilled by the great promise that God's people will be a royal priesthood unto him. That is a possibility. And he doesn't mean it literally, he means it symbolically. That's possible. Other people think this is all fulfilled in the priestly function of Jesus. I suppose that's a possibility. But friends, we have other passages of Scripture which speak of some kind of priestly service in the millennial reign, and I can't figure all of them out. But it's suggestive that this is mentioned here. Going on now, verse 23. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not considered what these people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he has also cast them off? Thus they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before them. My friends, this is heavy. God speaks to those who claim that he has cast off Israel as a nation before him. And what does he say? They've committed this sin, verse 24, they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before them. God said of those who thought that Israel was cast off from his love or cast off from his plan that they despised his people and therefore they sinned. They denied that Israel would continue as a nation, a collective people with whom God had a special plan and a purpose. And notice, he says a nation before them. That's what it says. He doesn't say before me. He says, okay, they're a nation before God. No, God says a nation before the world, before them. Friends, it is a heavy thing. It's dishonoring to the scriptures. And I'll say it, it's dishonoring to God to say that God is done with Israel in his plan. This is what he says. Thus they have despised my people as if they should no more be a nation before him. Finally, verse 25. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captives to return and will have mercy on them. Again, The analogy between day and night again, but notice verse 26, over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Friends, that is a very clear reference to genetic Israel. Now, 
The Bible teaches us the concept of spiritual Israel. Those who are the descendants of Abraham by faith. As far as I know, I don't have any Jewish blood in me. Though sometimes I think I should get that DNA test and find out. There are a lot of Polish Jews running around, so who knows? But as far as I know, I don't have any Jewish blood in me, but I'll tell you, I am a spiritual descendant of Abraham by faith. There is spiritual Israel, but it doesn't eliminate genetic Israel and God's plan for them. As he says right here, those descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's the bottom line. With the siege army around Jerusalem, God was utterly concerned to demonstrate to them I will restore. I don't care how bad the problems are in your life, it's not as bad as having a siege army around your city. God can and will restore you in Jesus Christ through the new covenant. Nobody here should lose hope. I prohibit you from leaving this room with lost hope. Do not, you cannot do it. God has given you too much confidence in his power to restore and rebuild and give his people a wonderful future. So much so that we will fear and tremble because the blessing is so big. Father, make it so. Thank you for the power of your restoration. Thank you, God. Thank you for a calamity far worse than we have faced. Lord, I think of the years when fire has surrounded this city and it felt like there was a siege army on. Even then it wasn't as bad as it was for Jerusalem. And even so, Lord, we see your restoration, we see your power, we see your grace, we fear and we tremble at the magnitude of the blessing that you've given us in the new covenant through your Messiah, Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise you. We give you honor, we give you our hearts here this evening. You are worthy of it and we yield to you in the matchless name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.